All right, <clears throat> let's finish this lecture. <clears throat> Get my voice back. There we go. Uh, okay, so part one, we went over this already, the Java server. Well, we actually only covered transaction management, which was the first part of this lecture. The second part is the web tearing and the Java servlet pages, which is part two. I found slide 40-something. This is where I left off. 42, thank you. Yes, here we go, web tiering. So when we start talking about servlets, we're start, starting to get into the web tiering. So a J2EE application web tier it makes the application's business logic available to the World Wide Web. So most people from a consumer point of view have no idea what you're logging into. When you go to a URL and you go and you log into an application, what you're usually logging into is a front-end web server. Web server is doing nothing more than handling the incoming client connections. And then behind the web server, we've got an application server. Behind the application server, we might have a database. We might have another server. We might have a file server. Any sort of an arrangement. And so the web tier handles all of the J2EE application communication with the web clients invoking business logic and transmitting data in response to incoming requests. So the web tier, the web itself, you know, let's get the web tier. Just think about, it does nothing more than handle clients. And you think about it, well, in the old days, we had one server people would log into and it would handle everything. They would do the application, it would run the programs, it would have everything on there. Um, which, you know, if you're scaling and you're going to handle a lot of simultaneous clients, why not put together a web tier? The web tier is just going to handle the connections, which is a lot of traffic to begin with, and then have that divert the traffic to other servers. So it's kind of like the gatekeeper or the front end into the applications. So the purpose of the web tier is a server in the web tier processes HTTP requests, if you have thousands and thousands and thousands of clients logging in, it makes sense to have your separate web tier. So in uh, J2EE applications, the web tier usually manages the interaction between the web clients and the application's business logic, uh, meaning it's the router, or the router, it's the, well, it's the tier that's routing the traffic to the applications. And it typically produces HTML and XML content through the web tier, and can generate and serve up any one of these content types, or any content type, I should say. But we're usually seeing XML and HTML, or XHTML, through this web tier. Uh, so while the business logic is often implemented as enterprise beans um, on another tier, it may be implemented entirely on the web tier. So you could stick everything all in one tier and just have the different interfaces. So web tier functions. Um, web tier typically performs the following functions. We have web-enabled business logic. So it's the web tier manages the interaction between the web clients and the application business logic, generates dynamic content. Uh, so it generates into, in terms of video, HTML, sound, audio, scripts, all sorts of things can run to generate content um, to give to the client, and presents data and collects input. So it can be used to translate HTTP put and get actions into a form of business logic that understands, you know, basically presents results as web content. More functions of the web tier. It controls screen flow. So the logic that determines which screen, which is going to be the user interface, that is which page is displayed next, usually resides on the web tier because the screen flow tends to be specific towards client capabilities. So if the client is a mobile client, the client's coming from another computer connection or another server, maybe without a UI, uh, the screen flow and content is going to be uh, determined by the web tier. Maintain state. So the web tier has a flexible, simple flexible mechanism, accumulating data for transactions, interactions, and user sessions. So it supports multiple and future clients types as well. So extendable mind types uh, describe web content. So web can support any current and future type of downloadable content that might exist. Um, so it's expandable, hopefully. Um, it may implement business logic. It doesn't have to, but it might. Um, while many enterprise applications implement business logic and the enterprise being web only, low to medium volume applications is simple. 
and simple transactional behavior can be implemented using the business logic entirely within the web tier. It does not have to be brought off onto different servers. So traditional web tier technologies. This is the more interesting part. So earlier releases of the H World Wide Web relied on HTTP servers to serve static HTML pages through HTML browsers. When you set up a web tier, you're pretty much using Apache if you're on the internet these days, or you're using um, another server technology. And what you're doing is you're opening up a port and you're making a directory available, and the directory has a bunch of static pages on there, HTML pages. You're still doing the same thing even when you're using JSP, because the HTML page is going over and it's running a bean, or it's running a script, Java JSP script getting something maybe dynamic from the server and then retrieving it back. So we quickly become clear that dynamic content generated on demand would make the web platform delivering applications <coughs> as well as content. So we need that dynamic behavior. Several mechanisms uh, were deployed to allow web servers to generate content on demand, all of which let the web server functionality extensions, uh, all of which uh, can be used through uh, web server functional extensions. This is the opposite of CGI. So originally we started out with what was called Common Gateway Interface, which I'm not going to read you the content on the slide, you can read it yourself, but what we were doing in the past was we had this, uh, call it a port, call it a directory, it's an entryway from the web server into the server to run programs and the programs that were running through the CGI port, or gateway, call it that, um, generated content that was sent back to the client through this gateway. And it was a way of creating dynamic behavior. Thing of the past, and then as I mentioned in our first class meeting uh, last, last session, um, it creates a lot of traffic, uh, creates a lot of processes, creates a situation in which you don't have very very good server utilization because it's bogged down. Each, each client that connects to the server creates its own process, creates its own application instance, and um, makes it so that uh, the server is not really managing the clients as a client, it's managing it as an individual request. So better technologies came around. Um, also, CGI was not as secure as the Java EE environment is. Um, doesn't provide any type of security features. In fact, it opened up the door. So pretty much any application that was running in that CGI bin directory or was loaded in that bin directory was available. So it was very simple, though. Um, it was very easy to use, uh, although it did not provide very many features. Um, so the web tiering technologies in the Java EE platform uh, go above and beyond. Uh, the CGI capabilities and make it so that um, the server is acting a bit more um, uh, streamlined and a bit more efficient. So in terms of the web tiering, it provided the benefit of the client-side scripting using compiled Java classes and standardized secure vendor-neutral environments. The web tiering also is a collection of web tier components, content, configuration information, and operate as a single unit. And it serves up to multiple clients. It's not a one client per process situation. So runtime support environment for the web application is called a web container. So there's some more terminology for you. Um, so the web container is that runtime support environment uh, for web applications. And think of it more like um, you know the web tier has a container, and the container is carrying all the web applications. The web application archive, the .war file, if you've seen those before from a programmer's perspective, combining um, file contains all of the classes, resources for the web application, kind of creates a container for it in itself, uh, along with XML deployment descriptor uh, that configures the application so the application can run. And uh, kind of just a compressed file, actually, the WAR file. And makes it so that you don't have to carry over all the images and scripts and code and pieces. It's just one file that retains all of that stuff, all compressed together. So, in terms of the technology, the platform specific, uh, the platform specification defines the contract between the web container and the web components themselves, defining the life cycle of the component containers, the components themselves, the behavior 
what must be implemented, security, all sorts of different features that go along with um, the delivery of those applications. So platform specifics, specifications are also defined in two types of web component technologies, and here is how this fits in with Java EE. So the web servlets and the server pages technology. And for anyone who's familiar with ASP from a Microsoft's perspective, this is the equivalent. So JSP and ASP are pretty much the same thing, active server pages. Uh, one's made by Microsoft, the other one's made by uh, well, Oracle now, but it used to be Sun. Uh, the Java equivalent to it. Um, we don't have servlets, though. We don't have servlets in the um, ASP environment. The technology of a servlet is equivalent, however, to the server in terms of the ASP equivalent. So let's see, talk about what these things are. Servlets and JSP. Uh, a servlet is a Java class that extends the J2EE server, uh, produces dynamic content in response to a request from a server. The server passes a service request to the servlet through the standard interface, which is the Java X servlet, which every servlet must implement. So think of servlets as classes that extend server behavior. And they're small programs, sort of like beans, but beans are resource managers. So servlets are classes that serve up information in response to requests from clients. A JSP page, and JSP is a scripting language. So what JSP is itself stands for Java server page. So the page itself is like an HTML content. It is an HTML page with specific markup that provides customizable behavior for generating dynamic content at runtime. So it's a script slash a page. So when you load up, you know, index.jsp, it's giving us the HTML interface, it's giving us the scripting, it's giving us everything we need to communicate with the server to process the dynamic behavior that we're interested in getting. Otherwise, we just do it in HTML and leave out scripting languages in general. So JSP page is usually translated into a servlet when it is deployed, is created into the servlet. And the technologies provide document-centric, document-centric is another vocabulary word for you, which is why it's in blue, rather than programmatic way of to specify the, uh, gen uh, the dynamic content. So document-centric means that the code is inside the document, sort of like a scripting language. Well, it is a scripting language, but it's specific towards the document in terms of the content. Now the web container, um, the Java 2 EE web application itself runs inside of the servlet web container. It's just another word for the servlet server. <laughs> but web container sounds a little bit better than a servlet server. Uh, it's a little bit more specific. So it's the container. It manages all the components, the life cycle of the components. It's kind of like the RMI registry of the RMI environment where you register objects and the objects reside. The, servlet, the web container registers the servlets and keeps the servlets um, instances contained. So there's only one instance of each object that's contained. And when the servlet loads up, each object is instantiated and becomes available to be serviced. So the container manages the component lifecycle, dispatches services request, service requests to application components, and provides standard interfaces for data, such as session data, information about the current requests, and things of that nature. Retains state of objects as well. So the web container provides the consistent interface uh, and the components that it's going to host, depending upon what's loaded. Uh, so web containers are portable across different application servers. You just load the file in there, that file the Java program in there, and it becomes a servlet. <laughs> so packaging and deployment of web applications are standard. Uh, the web application can be deployed to any Java EE server without compiling the code or rebuilding the application archive. So well, you're just moving it from one location to another and you start installing it on different servers. <laughs> so Java servlets. So Java servlet is a Java class that extends the compatible web server. So it's extending web server. Think of them as Java classes that generate dynamic HTML content using print statements, which is kind of interesting. Similar to CGI interface, where that supported the interface between the web and the 
applications themselves, supporting the request and response from a programming model. Actually, in the old CGI days, you used to write a Perl script or a C program that produced HTML output, and you sent the HTML output from the program through the web, you know, through HTTP, which is the HTTP protocol onto a, a client in a client browser. It's actually the same concept. So really, Java servlets are equivalent to CGI in a lot of different ways. It's just a modern day technology versus an older one. So servlets offer some important benefits over the earlier ones. Obviously, security is a big one. Compatibility with Java classes and Java in general versus, uh, you know, CGI is good for Perl. For, well, Perl was the biggest language used for it, but uh, C++, traditional style programming languages, for the Java support, the servlets provide a lot more in terms of the capabilities. And servlets are safer than extensive libraries, extension libraries, because Java, the virtual machine, can recover from a servlet that exits unexpectedly. And we've got garbage collection. Actually, we have the JVM. So if we have the JVM running, it's taking care of its instances of objects. So uh, it makes for a more efficient environment. Servlets are portable both at the source code level, because uh, the Java servlet specification, uh, and uh, they are binary level, because of the um, byte code that uh, you create into the class file that gets loaded into the server. And they also provide a richer set of standard services than the other wider adopted server technologies. <coughs> so JSP, Java Server Pages. There should be a space here, actually. JSP technology extracts servlets to a higher level, so directly competes with Microsoft Active Server Pages, ASP. That's what I was saying before. My ASP is the Microsoft equivalent to the Java JSP. And the page itself is a document containing fixed template text plus special markups for including other text or executing embedded logic, um, XML, or any type of uh, interface that's going to be combined. So the fixed template text is always served to the requester, just as it appears in the page, like traditional HTML. And the special markups come in three different forms. We can have a directive, a scripting element, or a custom tag. So if we create some custom tags, um, we can send data back and forth. So think of JSP as inside-out servlets, um, because they're, they're sort of like the out, output of a servlet, if you think about it. So it's kind of an inside-out servlet. Benefits of JSP. Um, they are easily combined static templates, including, and you can easily combine HTML with XML code fragments with code that generates dynamic contents, images, uh, scripts, other, you can mix and match technologies in with a JSP page. They are compiled into servlets when requested. Uh, so the pages, uh, the page authors can easily make updates that the presentation code can be recompiled, precompiled if desired. And they're easily changeable. Well, you got all the benefits of an HTML page essentially. The JSP tags are invoked uh, for invoking Java Bean components. Manage these uh, components completely, shielding the page author from the complexity of the application logic. Well, you're using a, <coughs> a scripting page to make an instance of a Java bean, or to, not make an instance, but to uh, call uh, features, um, run methods on a Java bean, uh, which is kind of interesting. So it provides the interface between the HTML and the beans. Developers can offer customized JSP tag libraries, and the JSP pages themselves have all the benefits of technologies, uh, Java technology, including robust memory management, security, and everything else that comes with Java. So it provides enterprise class scalability and performance. So some of the speed improvements that we uh, can achieve through using JSP, separating the content generation from the presentation. So the presentations in the H H X T yeah, excuse me, HTML format <laughs> The content generation can be from Java beans, from servlets, from anything on the server. So we're using the JSP technology, the web pages, using XML, HTML, everything, tags to design and format the results of, that appear on the page. 
if the core logic is encapsulated in tags and beans, then other individuals such as webmasters and web programmers can edit these pages without affecting the generalization of the the generation of the content because the contents are being gener generated on the server. So JSP makes it a little bit easier for non-programmers, for more web application people, to actually kind of up update, excuse me, update and customize the user interface of the user <coughs> interface through the HTML mock-up, the presentation of the data. It also emphasizes reusable components. <coughs> so most JSP pages rely on reusable cross-platform components or Java Enterprise Beans um, to perform more complex processing required for the application. So it mixes and matches and uses the best of both worlds. Um, unlike a, a true scripting language like PHP or Python that are it's basically running scripts, which is code that is producing results. In the JSP world, we're just calling components and we're calling things on the server through the web page rather than relying upon the language itself as a script to generate its own content. Um, it's using other components, so it's kind of a hybrid. It's not really, I don't know if I would call it a scripting language. It's more of a hybrid, hybrid interface to Java components. So developers can share and exchange components uh, that perform common operations or make them available to larger users and customer communities. Uh, so the component-based approach speeds up the overall development, lets organizations leverage their existing expertise and development efforts, and basically reuse stuff. It also simplifies page development with tags. Tags is you know, kind of an easy way to anyone who's ever tried HTML knows it's kind of easy, actually, a tag interface. Um, so you you know put that into a programming environment and it makes it easy. So web page developers are not always programmers familiar with scripting language, so encapsulates functionality required for dynamic content and easy to use JSP specific XML tags. So it uses XML like tags in terms of its formatting. Standard JSP tags can access and instantiate Java bean components. Uh, so sets set and retrieve bean attributes, download ap applets, perform other functions and other things during that time-consuming, difficult, excuse me, otherwise, doing things that would be otherwise difficult to program in or might be also time-consuming. So it kind of saves a lot of work and energy in terms of just being able to use tags to initiate behavior. <coughs> JSP technology is also extendable through development of customized tag libraries. So um, third-party uh, people, other people can create their own tag libraries for common functions, incorporate them in. So this lets uh, web page designers and people work with familiar tools and constructs such as tags and to perform um, sophisticated functions. So here's a simple example. What does this JSP look like? Here it is. Um, so here's a simple application that utilizes JSP. From the browsers, this is where we're going to actually, the client is going to actually call this JSP page it's going to have HTTP, HTML, XML protocols being used from the browser to access this JSP page. And the content of the JSP page might actually have HTML on it. And the HTML, or might actually be separated out into an HTML page that calls the JSP page. The JSP page calls the Java bean out here. and the Java you know, invocation method, let's say for JDBC or something, um, it may also work with other technologies as well. So this moder model basically uh, replaces CGI bin concepts with a single JSP page. So in the CGI bin era, we had a browser, and this was the CGI bin over here, and it went through this gateway, and it ran a program out here. So now this kind of represents the bin directory, actually. It represents the gateway in a lot of different ways. So the model has the following advantages associated with it. It's simple and fast to program because these are all in text. They're not compiled, although you can pre-compile uh, the JSP pages. The page author can easily generate dynamic content based on the request of the state of the resources. And uh, the architecture works well with many different applications, but it does not scale for a large number of simultaneous web clients accessing scaled 
scarce enterprise resources. Um, you know, the resource, you still need to have available resources for scaling. And as an example, if the uh, JSP accesses a database, it may generate many connections to a database which can affect the database performance. Versus calling to a bean and having the bean do the generation of the dynamic content coming from the, uh, from the database. Because you're still working with a one client request per process being created. So in terms of a large scale development, you might end up uh, with a not so efficient running server. Here's an example of a flexible application with Java servlets. So we have the client. We request to the servlet. JSP comes back with the response to the client. And we break it out into separate different JSP pages and separate different servlets so that we can take basically have the servlet do the work and use the JSP to deliver the content back to the client. <laughs> this is what you're going to be doing in one of the assignments that we have for this class. Actually, the assignment is not too hard. You're going to create an index HTML page, a JSP page, and you're given the code for a servlet, I believe. And you're, uh, you put the pieces together and you run it. It's not that hard of an assignment. So web-based clients uh, may make a request directly to the Java servlet, which actually generates the dynamic content, wraps the results into the results bean, and invokes the JSP page. And then the JSP page accesses the dynamic content from the bean and sends the results to the HTML, as HTML back to the HTTP protocol. So the approach creates a more reusable component so that can be shared between applications as you have the servlets running rather than pages and may implement as part of a larger application. So it still has scalability issues in terms of handling connections to enterprise resources such as databases. So here's a JSP scalable processing with enterprise bean technology, Java bean technology. So what we've done here started out with a simple JSP page, no servlets, no beans, <laughs> and the JSP connects to the JDBC and gets information from the database. Here we added a servlet component, let the servlet do the work, and then, you know, it's, it's kind of sort of like the RMI concept. There's only one object, one instance of that object created. Cuts down on the traffic a little bit. And we'll break it out a little bit further, scale it down, and actually add a bean to it and a servlet. Then we've got a good running kind of system. And that's one of the reasons why this is, technology is very popular. It's very flexible. You can run multiple different tiers, you can run multiple different components together, you can configure it for optimizing the resources that are available. So JSP page here can also act as a middle tier within the enterprise Java Bean architecture. In this case, the JSP page interacts with, <coughs> with back-end resources via the enterprise Java Bean component. So we have the browser, we have the JSP going through either RMI or another another technology, and accessing the Enterprise Java Bean. And the Enterprise Java Bean is going to be a Java program. Actually, all this stuff is Java program. The only thing that's not a Java program is HTML pages and JSP pages. And JSP pages look like ASP pages. They're just text pages with tags in them. So the Java Bean, Enterprise Java Bean component messages, <coughs> access to the back end resources, which provide scalable performances for a high number of concurrent users. You're going to go through this technique, use an Enterprise Bean if you're going to have a larger number of, of users simultaneously connected. So for e-commerce, for other applications, the Java Enterprise Beans uh, manage the transactions and underlying security. This simplifies the JSP page itself, makes the page not as uh, feature-rich. Instead, rather, we have uh, the Bean doing most of the work. The model will be supported, uh, is, will be supported by the Java 2 EE platform, or is supported, I should say. So, in a nutshell, this is the JSP versus, uh, excuse me, versus the servlet, and then along with the servlet, and along with Java Enterprise Beans as a technology which is how it's basically being put together. Now we have this old design pattern called the model view controller. And you're wondering, well, how does this fit in? It actually, the, this, this architecture here actually meets the design pattern for model view controller, um, which is one of the oldest object-oriented design patterns on the market. 
still being used. In fact, it's very popular for iPhone development, for um, all sorts of um, object-oriented design in terms of the methodologies. What we have in this example is the Enterprise Information System, the EIS down here. We have a classic web con customer, a wireless customer as an example, you know, on a mobile phone, an administrator, a supplier, maybe a B2B agent, maybe going through uh, some other application, some inter interface. And then we have the different views. So the model itself, we have the data, the view, or the user, the user interface to the data, and then the controlling of the data which is the three components of model view controller. In terms of the view, um, the HTML view for the classic computer user, the WML, the web uh, markup language for your web user that's going to go on a, you know, a phone. Actually, it's kind of interesting. This is more web component, web user more HTML based these days because, you know, in the old days the phones were smaller, they were more mobile. Now we got phones that are as powerful as computers and tablets and things like that. So we it's straight HTML. So WML had had a had a niche market for a while there, but we're still looking at development in an HTML and an XML. So because the screens are bigger now, processors are stronger. We don't have to worry about the mobile uh, drawbacks that we had before. Uh, we might have a swing or a JFC. In it for the administrator, Java Swing, um, or XML based, if we're, especially on this end here, if we're going from an application to an application, it might be an XML based web service that might exist. And it's all going in to this enterprise uh, application. So an online store may require HTML front end for customers, WML for wireless, Java Swing, or Java Swing clients for administrators, or XML for web service suppliers. <laughs> In terms of the design pattern, the model itself encapsulates the application state, responds to the state uh, queries, exposes application functionality, modifies views of change and stuff. And the view itself renders the models and you know provides the UI, requests updates from the models, sends user uh, gestures to controllers. The controller defines the logic, the application behavior. It maps user actions to, mo to module updates, uh, selects view of response, maybe, uh, for the functionality. So you can kind of see how the different states work together. The state changes between the controller and the model, and between the query from the view to the model uh, around. So this is really what's meant in terms of the model view controller, is that design method or pattern, I should say. And there are not too many design patterns out there, actually, but uh, this whole enterprise beam and the whole servlet follows through model view controller, if you think about it. <coughs> <coughs> so separating out business logic from presentation. In terms of separating out the business log logic from the presentation, it has several different important benefits to it. <coughs> well, not only can you make the UI and the presentation available towards web programmers and people who aren't, pro you know, people who aren't necessarily programmers but more designers and then you can separate out the functionality so that the designers are doing the artistic work and the programmers are doing the functionality and creating that dynamic content. We have some uh, pros and cons to it. We can minimize the impact of change so business rules can be changed in their own layer with little or no modification to the presentation layer. Um, so it's kind of like you know the pros and cons or the benefits I should say for modulizing or for creating separate objects for things. Um, obviously, the more modules you create, the easier, the more flexible, the more reusable the design is going to be. So uh, increased in main increases maintainability if we uh, separate out the business logic from the presentation layer. And the business logic itself is expressed in separate components. Uh, and maybe access referentially uh, can be modified in one place in the source code so it produces behavior changes anywhere the component is used and the logic itself is only um, housed in one area so it can be easily modified for all functionality that uses it provides a client independent and code reuse as well uh, independent you know intermingling data 
presentation and data logic for particular clients of different types. We can also separate out the developer. So separate business logic presentation allows developers to concentrate on their area of expertise, as I mentioned before. Web designers can concentrate on artistic and UI, whereas uh, programmers can actually look at the business logic. So here we have our application complexity versus robustness. So complexity versus robustness in terms of uh, what's going on. And you can actually kind of see how the technologies kind of fit into the big picture. HTML pages, not very complex, easy to do, not very robust. You can't do very much with HTML. You can pretty much just show content to the user. <laughs> so basic JSP pages and servlets provide HTML pages, JSP pages and servlets. A little bit more complex, however, a little bit more robust. Gives us more scripting capabilities, gives us more functionality. JSP pages with modular components, a little bit more complex, again, more robust in terms of its ability to provide HTML pages, JSP pages, servlets, Java Bean components, and then customized tags. And then on the far right here, <coughs> the uh, JSP pages with modular components and enterprise beans. If we combine all of it together, then we get the best of everything along with the enterprise beans that go along with it. So it's basically a combination and mix and matching. Um, what makes these technologies kind of interesting is and is that they're flexible. You don't have to have you don't have to use enterprise beans. You don't have to use servlets. You don't have to use JSP actually. Uh, but you can and you can mix and match all of the technologies together. And uh, then it becomes, you know, a matter of choice and a matter of design preference. So some designs actually lend themselves better to certain configurations. So the model number two recommended here for the model view control architecture, if we have the uh, web browser out here, makes a request. We have the controller servlet, the view, which could be the JSP modules, and instantiates a model itself. So we have the model view controller in here, <coughs> where the view is used to, from a JSP perspective, to send a response back to the web browser. The web browser makes its request to the controller, the servlet, um, and the servlet would instantiate a Java bean or use a Java bean, and the bean would actually uh, attach to the enterprise server. And you know, in this example here, we've got a persistent server with a database on it. It would uh, the bean here would be in charge of requesting information uh, using a JDBC connection to the, to the to the database. So we can kind of see this again. Another picture of the model view controller architecture put into perspective. This actually kind of gives it a nice nice kind of layout, I should say, in terms of uh, taking the design pattern and applying it to web services. In the model number two, which is uh, this is one here, model number two. It integrates the use of both servlets and JSP in this model, in this mode. The JSP is used for the presentation layer and the servlets for processing the tasks. So the servlets out here would be processing the request. The JSP would be used to send stuff back. So you can sort of see how the technologies are working together. And the servlet acts as the controller responsible for processing the request and creating any of the, the beans needed for the JSP pages themselves. So the controller is also responsible for deciding uh, to which JSP pages uh, to forward the request to. And then the JSP pages retrieve the objects created by the server that extracts the dynamic content for insertion within the template itself. So, so how do JSP pages work? Ah, so we've talked about the technologies in terms of putting it together with the model view controller um, design pattern and how the pieces have different responsibilities. Big question to consider is what do these JSP pages do? They're not scripting pages. They're not applications. They're, they're not fully presentation. We have HTML that does that. How do they fit into the big picture? Basically, they're web pages with traditional HTML and bits of Java code mixed in. Not JavaScript. That would be JavaScript on a regular HTML page. So the file extension of the page is a .jsp, which tells the server that it's a JSP page, kind of like an ASP extension on a Microsoft server. 
<coughs> so rather than HTML and HTM, JSP tells the server that the page requires special handling and that it will be accomplished by the server extensions or a plugin in the browser or a plugin on the server. So when the JSP page is called, it will be compiled by the JSP engine into a Java servlet. So the JSP engine actually creates the servlet from the page. So, which is kind of like reason why it's called a servlet and not a server. It's a it's a smaller piece of the server, and and they can be pre-compiled ahead of time by being loaded on the server, um, or they can be called uh, from a client and then loaded at runtime. At uh, the point that the server is handled by the service servlet engine, just like any other servlet, we can actually create servlets that are jo pure Java code without any HTML or XML markup and load them into the servlet and they would be considered true servlets. So servlet engine then loads the servlet class using the class loader, executes and creates the Java HTML and sends it to the browser. It's kind of like running a Java program through a web browser. That's what it is equivalent to. Servlet creates any necessary objects, writes any objects as a string to the output stream in the browser. <coughs> so the next time the page is requested, the JSP engine executes the already loaded servlet unless the JSP page has changed, in which case it automatically recompiles the servlet and then executes the recompiled page. So you got the best of both worlds, really, because you got something that's dynamic that can change that's not you know that's in static form I mean it's a text page that's loaded from a browser and yet it turns into an application and it contains Java code so what we're looking at here is a request and this is a form you can't see it says user what does it say user task request form it's a form somebody filled in they pressed a submit button the request went to the web server the web server used the server extension <coughs> to load up the JSP engine to compile that page to a runnable program, ran it through the serverlet engine, sent it back to the server extension, which sent it back to the web server that sent the computed output to the client, which is really how JSP is working. So it's, and that's why I say it's not really a scripting language, because a scripting language would run right here. Like if you loaded PHP or Python or Perl, it's loaded from either the web server or an application server. Usually it's the web server. And the script itself is running the script, and the script itself is sending that feedback from web server here. So the server extensions and server extensions actually compiles the page, turns it into an object, and treats it like an object that can use other objects on the server, which makes it a little bit more powerful on the server side. <coughs> the servlet's job. So what are these what are the functionality that the servlets actually perform? They read explicit data sent from the client, the form data. They read ex implicit data from the client, request headers. They generate the results, they send the uh, explicit data back to the client in an HTML format. They send it, uh, implicit data back to the client, status codes and responses to those headers. So here we have the client over here, the end user who is contacting the web server. The web server is contacting the database, legacy applications, Java applications, B2B applications. And this is just a list of the technologies that the web server can actually use uh, in terms of the JDBC, RMI, XML. So we're not going to hit too much XML in this course, but XML is just like HTML in a lot of ways. Except for HTML is used to mark up text, HTML, XML is used to mark up uh, data, uh, so you can transport data back and forth. But XML is actually not too bad. I mean, it's as easy as to program than it is HTML. And normally you don't write an entire program in XML either, it's used for markup of the data. So you can send it from a server to a server. So the need for JSP. So with servlets, it is easy to read form data read HTTP request headers, uh, set HTTP, HTTP status codes and response headers, use cookies and session tracking, share data among servlets, remember data between requests, get fun high paying jobs. <laughs> uh, but it 
sure is a pain to use those print line statements to generate HTML, maintain that HTML. Well, because we're still working with a text page, and so we're still using primitive CGI kind of interfaces where we're printing the HTML output, so our print lines are actually generating HTML code. <coughs> Here's the JSP framework in terms of the idea. Use regular HTML for most of the pages. Mark servlet code with special tags. And the entire JSP page gets translated into a servlet once. And then the servlet is what actually gets invoked for each one of the requests. And then here's kind of a sample JSP page here where we've got a, you know, HTML in there. And we have a link in here. This is JSP style, CSS. You can use a CSS sheet for that. Order confirmation. You know, thanks for your order. Here's the request. Get parameter title of the request. And the rest of the information that might be in the HTML format that's going to be sent back. Advantages of JSP over competing technologies versus ASP or Cold Fusion. Better language for dynamic part? Mm, some might argue. ASP is pretty similar in functionality. Portable to multiple servers and operating system? Yes. ASP only works on Microsoft servers and Microsoft environments. So JSP is actually more portable because it works on everything, except for Microsoft. <laughs> so it's kind of like the opposite. Versus PHP, better language for dynamic part. Mm, you can run Java programs from JSP. You can't do that from PHP. Better tool support, yeah. And the environment's better. There's hardly very many tools for PHP programming. It's all done in Notepad these days or you know, text editors versus pure servlets. More convenient to create HTML code than Java source code. If you're creating a servlet, you're going to be writing it in Java. Which is easier, HTML or Java? Some people might argue and say Java. I don't know. I think, I don't know, it depends on what side of the fence you stand on, but HTML is pretty easy for non-programmers. You can use standard tools for it. Dreamweaver, stuff like that. You can mix in. <coughs> You can divide out and conquer. JSP programmers still need to know servlet programming, uh, to the most part, because right, you need to know what you're calling. You're putting code in a, a page that's not maybe Java code, but you're still trying to make instances of methods, instances of objects, and call them and and uh, run methods on objects. Versus client-side JavaScript in a browser, JSP runs on a server. So we have compatibility mostly. Do not overlap with JSP, but you can control the servlet, not the client. And you also have a richer language on the server. Uh, JavaScript is functional to a certain point. Great for client-side applications, um, but you're giving everything to the client. So your code is essentially, through JavaScript, is running on your client. Um, instead of running on your server, it means you're freely giving away the source code uh, with the HTML page. So JSP versus server-side JavaScript, live wire, broadband, richer language. Yeah, very similar, but very rich in terms of its features. Versus static HTML, well, JSP is giving us uh, dynamic features and it's adding dimensions for a future. Features no longer an all or nothing decision. We can use combinations of different technologies together. So here's an example of a JSP. Uh, it's called the JSP Expressions. We have keywords here uh, that are going to be used in your description. Quick example, there's a little style sheet that can be used with it. So you can use it on a JSP page, you can use CSS, you can use HTML, you can use Python, PHP. You know, you can use, you mix and match. It's, uh, it's, an, it's all in one page. It's all text format. So you can mix and match technologies. And look at that, we're using Java Util Date. So we're using Java programming language in a JSP page, so which comes in handy if you know Java. So session, get ID, set ID, all the different parameters that can be run. And here's the results of this page, and this is what the page started out with from an HTML perspective and from the, the JSP code that's put in there. And the page looks like this. <coughs> and you can see that the page runs with expressions.jsp, it's a file extension. And uh, it's running, you know, a Java util date 
So we got we have the date from a Java command, and these are these are just this is just Java source code, new Java date. So imagine being able to write Java source code in an HTML page, and you got JSP. <laughs> and uh, you know, well, how does it run? Well, it has to go through that server. So the JSP page gets compiled, and it gets processed through the the servlet, which is nothing more than a JVM. It's a mobile version of the JVM, server, server version of the JVM, virtual runtime machine. So this code gets created into bytecode on the server. So on the Java, on, on the client machine, if they looked at it, you know, well, they're not going to see it because the page is being loaded from the server. But even if they saw it, they'd see the source code. You know, but they're not going to see, you're not going to put passwords for database logins and stuff here. Instead, this code is going to make an instance of the enterprise bean. And the enterprise bean is going to be located somewhere on the server and that bean is going to have the password information for the, for the, for the database. And that one's going to be responsible as a resource manager to take care of the connection to the database. So you're not giving away any secrets to the client in terms of security. Most common misunderstandings, forgetting that JSP is a server-side technology, thinking it's a client-side technology could be a problem. Very common question. I can't do such and such with HTML. No, you can't. <laughs> Will JSP let me do it? No, JSP only runs server technologies. It's not going to replace HTML or have you be able to do things that HTML can't do. Why doesn't this question make any sense? JSP runs entirely on the server, uh, so it doesn't change content on the browser uh, or anything that the browser can handle. Similar questions. How do I put a normal applet in a JSP page? Well, you can actually just use the applet tab. Tag, excuse me. Uh, it's just like an HTML page. How do I put an image? Well, you use the image tag, just like HTML. <laughs> so, <coughs> and how do I use Java? Oops. How do I use Java um, script, Acrobat, anything? You'll see the appropriate tag. You can embed anything. It's HTML and Java all in one. So you might want to think of JSP as a hybrid um, interface to Java. It's a non it's a non bytecode compiled program that you're writing and you're putting the text and mixing it in with other technologies which gives us JSP. Second most common misunderstanding is the translation and request time confusion. So what happens at page translation time when JSP constructs constructs get translated into server code and the page itself the JSP the source code that's written in Java gets compiled <laughs> and the compile turn co compiled code turns into the servlet and the servlet runs on the JVM equivalent servlet what happens at request time the servlet gets executed well no interpretation of the JSP occurs at that time the original JSP page is totally ignored at the request time only the servlet that results from it is used so it's kind of like sending a program through source having it compiled once it's out there sitting there you don't have to look at the source anymore you're just looking at the executed page that's coming out of the Java um, the bean that was created or the excuse me the servlet that was created when does the page translation occur when it's being run? So typically the first time that the JSP page is accessed after it is modified. Uh, so when it's being run, uh, this should never happen to real users. Developers should test all JSP pages. They install, hopefully. <laughs> page translation does not occur for each request. Depends on which page you're requesting. Only the pages that are being requested are going to be translated and compiled. So kind of a just-in-time kind of compilation. And then if the page changes, it's recompiled automatically, dynamically. So JSP servlets in the real world. Let's talk about airlines. Everybody uses it. <laughs> Delta, United, I can you know, go through the list here. But this is an example of where JSP and servlets are being used right now. Uh, because they can... They integrate really well with the presentation, with, it, with HTML presentation in terms of a web interface. It gives us that dynamic behavior where the servlet can actually go out and log in and see 
you know, what flights are available, and then run the queries that are being needed. Financial institutions, financial services also use it. Wells Fargo, American, uh, Bank of America, banks use JSP with servlets because you're going to have all of the functionality occur on the server, and the servlet works in really quite well with a HTML interface um, as well as other scripting languages. Just because you're using JSP doesn't mean you can't use everything else. Cold Fusion, and you can use tons of stuff with it. Uh, retail. Retail stores use it. So we got Sears, Walmart, and practically every website out there is using JSP and servlets. Uh, it's pretty popular, I should say. Google, half eBay, half eBay, half dot eBay, eBay, half dot com. <laughs> Netscape, well, I don't think Netscape, is Netscape still around? Firefox. Actually, that was more Mozilla. Netscape, I don't know. Netscape's a different company. I don't think they're still around. Dice, they're still around. All right, summary. <coughs> JSP makes it easier to create and maintain HTML while still providing full access to servlet code. Okay, JSP pages get translated into servlets. They get translated into compiled code. It is the servlet that runs at request time, not the page. The page just gets translated. Clients do not see anything JSP related. They can't. It's hidden because it's running on the server, not running on the client. And you will still need to understand servlets if you're writing JSP. It doesn't, it doesn't avoid um, you having to know something about servlets. Uh, so understanding how JSP really works, servlets codes called from JSP, knowing when servlets are better than JSP, mixing servlets and JSP. So other technologies use similar approaches, but they aren't portable and don't let you use Java for real code. So yeah, this is one of the biggest selling points of JSP is you're writing Java code in it. So if you want to write Java code, you're doing the JSP route. Otherwise, you're going to pick and learn another language, a scripting language to use. Here's some resources that still work. I have tried these. Um, I don't know if this free online book. Actually, let me just see this real quick. Mm, Customized Java 2 EE training. The site's still here, and there are some free PDF books on here as well. Uh, so the link does still work, which is good. Uh, the tutorial here is probably upgraded to a newer version as Java has, up, has been upgraded. Uh, some of the other ones, the server-side articles, let's see if that still opens. Java News, yeah, the links are still good for the most part. All right, I think that, that is the last slide, but just oh, let me make sure. Yep, it was the last slide. All right, so I'm going to end this lecture. This was the second part of Lecture 6 on uh, the JSP servlets and Java transactions, transaction management, uh, to kind of complete your background on that. Um, and again, uh, you will have an assignment that you'll need to do that will exercise JSP. But it's not going to, I mean, it's just writing, it's, it's the same as what you've been doing so far. It's just writing Java code. And HTML code, well, HTML code part will be new to you. Um, I went over the assignments last time, however, so I'm not going to repeat it again. But uh, it is like, it's, a, oh, it's like a tutorial almost. It's not really even a programming assignment. It's a pretty easy one. But you'll uh, have to install uh, Glassfish or Apache or something in order to get that to work. If you don't have those things installed, it's not going to work because the server's not going to load. But you can run them all from one computer if you want. So let me end this video.